Welcome to this very special episode of Damn Parenting, your English-speaking parenting podcast from Amsterdam. We're your hosts, Maren and Eva, and today we have a very special guest with us, with whom we will have a heartfelt exploration about a difficult childbirth journey. This is for everyone who was left with emotional scars, and we extend our warm embrace to those who may not have experienced previous pregnancies or birthing journeys they had wished for and now find themselves pregnant once more and maybe apprehensive of what the future holds. We are deeply honored to have the remarkable Elena Standring join us today for this interview. Not only is she an extraordinary doula, but she also possesses a unique expertise in nurturing emotional healing following challenging childbirth experiences. Together, we embark on a journey of illuminating the path towards renewed hope and resilience for those in the first trimester and beyond. Here we are, and we're going to be speaking to Elena, and we are going to be discussing this very delicate topic. Welcome. Thank you for Thank joining you. us. Thank you. We're delighted to have you here. So first off, I think it'll be best to actually find out more about you, a little bit of your background and where you are at this moment. So hi, I'm Elena. I am a professional birth doula. I've been a professional birth doula for almost 10 years. In uh, February next year, it will be 10 years. Prior to being a birth doula, I was a headhunter in banking and financial services. And kind of at the end phase of that, I had the privilege and possibility I didn't have children at the time, to become a life coach. And it's through that journey that I took to become a life coach alongside my work that I had the possibility to confront the deep fears, actually, that I had around becoming a mother and my own capacity for becoming a mother. And it's really directly through the engagement with that fear and those beliefs and those worries that then... When I became pregnant and I was looking for somebody to coach me through my pregnancy and birth, that I re-encountered the work of doulas. And, you know, I was lucky to have a wonderful community around me who all did a double take and suggested, well, that would be a very logical next step for me too. And through looking for a birth coach, I did actually have the possibility and privilege and joy of becoming a doula whilst I was pregnant with my son. My son is now nine and a half. And throughout the time that I've been mothering, that I've been doulaing, I've had this saturation in the journey and birth of myself as a mother. And lots of times her people really like ask me why I'm a doula and suggest that I probably really love cuddling babies. And of course I do. Who doesn't? But actually what I really, really love is bearing witness to as a holy witness to mothers, fathers, partners, people as they become parents. And there's a very natural extension of my coaching work and my doula work and this kind of joy that I have at witnessing evolution. I've also had the possibility to really buckle down and, you know, get knee deep into trauma. And so I'm also a trauma specialized doula and I teach lots of different birth workers, midwives, gynecologists, and that's the Mary Poppins that comes after you have a baby in the Netherlands, all about trauma-informed care for birth. And I think that's initially how we started talking about my participation in your amazing podcast, because we were thinking that we should talk about birth trauma. And then we thought, okay, there's actually lots of other things to, to talk about. Right. Yeah. It's a, it's a very delicate subject because one of the things we had spoken about ourselves was the fact that trauma is a huge word and it's, it's not a word we would easily kind of say I have trauma because we see trauma as like a, a giant thing that's usually associated with wars or with abuse or things like this. So I think one of the first things I would love to be able to really delve into is to examine the terminology of birth trauma. Like how do we identify that we, we are in that position, that our last birth or any other birth that we might have given to how do we know that we can say hey you know this it's not sitting right with me you know how, how is it yeah. that we can use that to identify this big question so one of the things that I would say is that a very large proportion of people who have given birth are walking around with no idea that they are suffering from the byproduct of unresolved trauma around their birth 
I do think that for decades now, I mean, in some ways, fortunately, but in other ways, unfortunately, I do think that for decades, women and birthing people have been diagnosed with postpartum depression when actually they are suffering from the immediate side effects of a deeply traumatic event. I think that whilst trauma and PTSD and how trauma can affect us has become a lot more commonplace a topic in public discourse, public rhetoric, we do still have a long way to go in acknowledging how traumatic birth can be as society. Because, you know, as mothers, as parents, one of the biggest things that we come up against as we begin to try to vocalize or voice how we're feeling about our birth experiences, people try and sweep it under the carpet. And they'll say, well, you've got a happy, healthy baby. That's all that matters, right? That's what it was all for. It was worth it in the end. And so oftentimes, even before somebody's rattled this platitude off, Something is happening internally to say, and I should be grateful because I know X, Y, Z number of people who can't even get pregnant. I know X, Y, Z number of people who have suffered from multiple infant losses or miscarriages. It's not that bad. My baby's fine. I'm here. I'm standing. And, you know, interestingly, a couple of days ago, I was watching a symposium for birth workers and there was a really wonderful labor and delivery nurse from the state. And I've been following her stuff for two or three years and I've never really like heard her full personal story. She has been a birth nurse for like, I don't know, 13 years, I think 12 or 13 years. And she, by the time she had her first baby, she had... Uh, attended hundreds and hundreds of births. I mean, the industrial complex of the birth system in America is also something, but that's a whole other podcast. And she felt like, I know everything I need to know. I'm going to give birth surrounded by, by my colleagues who I love and trust. And I can't wait to give birth. And she says it took almost five years for her to recognize that the unease and the depression that she was diagnosed with and the physical manifestation of the trauma of her birth took almost five years for her to recognize you know one of the things that we had discussed was her talking about what it is to begin to confront birth trauma as you're preparing for another birth what we do see with all kinds of trauma are that there are little portals or moments of evolution in our life. I say moments of evolution. I mean, they they always feel like, you know, the world has shifted on its axis. But, you know, things like getting married, getting pregnant again, facing the death of someone we love, big picture events like the pandemic, moving house, our children becoming the age that that we were when we experienced something previously difficult or traumatic or life-changing. These are moments in life when trauma can, previous trauma can unexpectedly surface within us. And that is sadly why a lot of people don't recognize that they've experienced birth trauma until they need to prepare for a new birth. And then it begins to feel insurmountable or extremely distressing. Yeah, this was actually one of the questions that we had also written down. When is the, put this in quotation, the typical time when people realizing, oh, there is something broader going on. And you've just said that it's so individual and it can be triggered by any specific life event. And of course, another birth is a a very big trigger because it's directly related but then you also just said any big life event where a lot of shifting is going on and that might even be moving to another country or like a a big rattling of the environment that I'm in can surface these feelings so and that's also then maybe another question where I guess then it's also possible after years and years to address this right so you can also work with clients when they said oh I've given birth, I don't know, maybe they have multiple children already, but then they realize after five years, actually, like something is coming up now, I can identify it. And so it's possible to still go back in retrospective, even if it's years and try to address it. Always, always, always. It is never too late to address a traumatic experience in your life. And, it, you know, it can be, that's also the thing, huh, that uh, if you if you're facing giving birth the first time, 
that it can be that that triggers trauma from a previous experience and often how we think in our rhetoric around you know positive vibes positive vibes in pregnancy being positive for our babies to have a positive experience in our bodies then we can often be left with this thought like oh but I shouldn't be looking under the carpet at these shadows right now because that's not going to be good for our baby for my baby Mm -hmm you can deal with trauma whether that's previous birth trauma or previous life trauma when you're pregnant and if anything like that comes up I would encourage everybody watching this to invest the time and emotional energy in doing it because we do also know unfortunately that previous traumatic experience or previous birth trauma does leave people more susceptible to experiencing their new birth experiences as traumatic. Mm. Mm. I guess it also reflects, I can imagine, in your parenting, right? Because your child is, I don't want to frame this so negatively, but of course, this birth gave you this trauma or triggered something else. And then you have the visual recognition of it every single day that this is, I don't want to say this is the reason why, but this birth experience is the reason why you're going through this. And then I guess it yeah, can unconsciously affect your parenting maybe also when you're constantly dealing with these, shoving these feelings down, shoving them down. And I shouldn't feel this. And why am I so angry? Why am I so upset? Why am I so stressed? And I know I get in when I get into these situations that are tough with my child, I have this physical, I feel it physically in my body. Like I have something that sits somewhere and then I need to address it or I know that I can address it. Yeah. And that's the travesty of birth trauma. You know, it can play out in multiple ways. It can mm. play out for a very large percentage of people by them abandoning plans to have a family of a certain size suddenly Mm -hmm. they don't want to have another baby and the plan that they had for three or four children turns out to actually no i'm just happy with one and it it, it's not even that somebody who's experienced birth trauma would say i just can't face it again it would just Mm -hmm. be to say no this is enough how people can really repress it but the travesty of trauma and the way it impacts how you feel about parenting, how you do parenting, how you feel about your body, how you feel about your sexuality, how you feel about your relationship, how you were treated by your partner, not only during the event itself, but also even if there was never the possibility for you to speak out that it was a traumatic experience, there can also be harbored sense of anger and frustration and rage Mm. that uh, your nearest and dearest didn't see that you were traumatized and for something that can be so I want to say so easily addressed and that's probably doing a disservice because it's it's not easy It, it, it it's a it's a multiple layer process to deal with birth trauma but it's it ha- it ha- the treatment, the different treatments that we have as a possibility to deal with birth trauma have a really high success rate. And the travesty of imagining that people ha- don't recognize that they're carrying birth trauma or that they do and that it is, like you say, a kind of insidious, infecting influence in ha- the way you parent, the way you feel in your relationship, the way you feel in your body. I would also venture the process of matrescence. Mm -hmm. There is the birth trauma itself, but then there's also this birth trauma in terms of a traumatic experience of you yourself being birthed as a mother. And that goes so deep. It goes so deep. This can have like hormonal influence and impact on how you, you know, inhabit your menstrual cycle, for example. And that's why it's so important that we talk about it and that we talk about all the different ways that it can manifest and that we that we really illuminate how easy it is to access help when you're ready because nobody's going to access help until they're ready. And if that's a year later, if that's a decade later, you know, the, the example about what you proposed there, like, is it ever too late? I will never forget going on my way to a Kram Bazook, so a, a postpartum visit to a family that I had supported in 
what was actually a very, on the surface, you would think, oh, this was a really traumatic birth. And I was on the way to the hospital to visit them in hospital still. I stopped on the way to get some sunflowers because it was in the middle of the summer. And I stopped at the market in Newmarket, And it was a really, like, she must have been mid-70s if she was a day, you know, mid-70s. And she said, oh, prachtig, eh? really beautiful flowers. Who are, you, who are you buying these for? And I said, oh, I'm going on a crown bazook. She said, oh, is it, you know, close friend? And I said, no, I'm a birth doula and I'm specialized in, in trauma. And this was a difficult birth. And I really want to just show up and be there and hold space for all the feelings that come. She burst into tears mm -hmm. and she told me her three birth journeys from, you know, the first one, like almost 50 years ago. And I was with her for quite a long time. I also had some tears, but she held and her, we live in the Netherlands, so we know how old some people who live in these parts can be but I'll never forget how she held my arm and she said I can't tell you how different I feel that you heard my story today hmm. makes me tear up hearing this yeah I, yeah, I literally I'm like um. oh <laughs> you wow. know it is and that is the thing that and that's what's so beautiful about what you're doing huh? like when we hold space for each other That's also the point about birth trauma. It doesn't even have to be like a therapeutic relationship, but it does need to be that you have an experience of sharing your story and feeling seen, heard, respected and cherished just as you are, just as your experience was. That changes so much already. And of course, any professional is also going to say, I'm so sorry you experience that in that way that must have been so scary and so disappointing even though you're clearly a mother who is overjoyed one doesn't detract from the other that's yeah. it right with yeah. parenting the ambiguity and the yeah. <laughs> crazy crazy heart landscape that we give birth to when we give birth even if we give birth under traumatic circumstances we have the capacity to hold space for all of it it's all true and one part doesn't detract from the other part yeah i think this is so important what you said this the duality of these feelings so both can coexist at the same time i can yeah. deeply love my child and being a mother and i can also deeply hurt from this experience and both can yeah coexist at the same time and i think it's also very important what you said the we feel when we're in these experiences and in these feelings that it's we feel this is so big and so overwhelming and we're standing in in front of this big pile and this big mountain and we feel like this is just too much so we shove it aside but when you say it is And you said we don't want to use easy in this context, but it is no. then it is then easy when you see how quickly and effective you can address it. And I hope this is for everyone who's listening out there and is following their own journey while listening that it is relief and it can be addressed and it can be addressed with help. And it might seem so scary and big and overwhelming, but there are mechanisms that can quickly change so, so much. And like you said, yeah. it can be this conversation at a flower stand where you just had 10 minutes of someone listening, you wanted to unload it, and then maybe that was what you needed. Because sometimes we also think of trauma, it has to be this big, giant, painful process to peel the onion. And it can be this, of course, but it can also sometimes be, thank you for just letting me unload this here and let sit on it and look at this big pile. We can appreciate it. And now I can let it go. Yeah. What I want to say also as an extension to that, and this is really her, one of the big focuses of the course that, that I offer for professionals about birth trauma and about trauma-informed care, what we do see as birth trauma in its prevalence begins to be more and more and more recognized is that care professionals, particularly her, like more allopathic or like Western medicine minds, they want to know what to do to take the pain away. And actually, one of the things that I think we need to talk about more and more is the gift of post-traumatic growth 
And this would be for me, if you talk about, you know, standing in that cave with all those stones and that mountain in front of you. Post-traumatic growth is the beginning of this light shining through all that. Post-traumatic growth is a term that was coined by Tadeshi and Calhoun in the work that they did with American veterans who were stu- who they studied uh, what PTSD is, how it manifests, how they can look to support PTSD healing in veterans. And they identified this term, they coined this term, they identified that post-traumatic growth can be measured across five different regions of, you know, how you show up in uh, regions or aspect of, with regards to how you show up in the world. And this is about deep internal shifts and changes in who you are, how you see yourself, how you show up in the world, how you engage in relationships, how you identify and pursue your purpose in the world, your relationship to your spirituality and to your concept of the meaning of life. Now, for us to overlook the capacity of post-traumatic growth, and crucially, post-traumatic growth only happens when you actively engage in the process of healing from a traumatic event. So it comes only when you have the the willingness, the support, the space, even if it is that 15-minute conversation at the flower stall, but that you have this capacity to actively engage in how you truly feel about this experience, that you have this space to truly confront how deeply this affected you and that you begin to unravel the layers and to relinquish the layers that then makes space for this really hopeful scenario of the internal shift and growth and evolution that are embodied with the process of post-traumatic growth. So, you know, it's always a paradigm shifter in the course that we teach because, you know, we have a lot of medical professionals in there who are like then suddenly realizing, oh, but hang on a minute, then if we're offering EMDR to people who've just given birth before they've had a chance to recognize and acknowledge that they're carrying birth trauma, then we're also taking away the possibility of them having post-traumatic growth because Mm -hmm. the brain doesn't have the time to actually recognize the trauma. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in some ways, you could also say how the hope is very simply that sometimes trauma, however wrong it is that it's experienced, and I'm definitely not taking away from that, can be a portal to really beautiful, positive change. And the idea that even just one person listening to this can actively recognize that maybe this is applicable to them and that they have the possibility to then embrace the courage that it takes to ask for help and that then they experienced post-traumatic growth whilst they're parenting tiny humans, medium-sized humans, teenage humans. This makes me hopeful. That's, um, yeah, I mean, one of the things here in the Netherlands is like the health system is great and, you know, they're, you know, everything's kind of covered and so that's great. But one of the things I know personally is to try and get therapy here. It can take a very, very, very long time because the waiting lists are just, it was insane in COVID times. And obviously thereafter, I mean, we're all kind of still, you know, getting a foot. There's a lot more mental health people available and there's a lot more options, which has been amazing. So for those out there who aren't sure yet about how to do it or what to do, can you just even provide like something that they can begin their process at at home in their own space that they're able to do themselves comfortably before taking an active step? That was something that might give them the strength to start it and then maybe give them the strength to proceed to go to the house arts to say hey this is what I really need yeah so here we do need to embrace nuance I would love to say that there are three steps that will suit everybody but the reality is there may be some people for whom these self-care steps would be potentially dangerous for you know one of the books that I would recommend is how to heal a bad birth It's a very tenderly written, well-structured book. It's a very big book, and that can feel like a mountain in front of you, but I really do recommend it because it's really worthwhile. But I think that with respect to the nuance and the discernment that I do want to encourage here, 
you know, it's really that, like as, as Marin shared, how that you can have these moments in parenting where you just notice from your physical reaction, like, oh, I... I am out of my window of tolerance for this intensity and I'm feeling it in my body, but actually this is like overwhelming my nervous system, my mental functioning, my, my brain, my psyche. If you get to that stage, then put the book down, wait for another time for it to be the time to pick that book up. Very, very, very simply, have a think about your community, your family, your online community, a professional that you've heard good things about in the community. Maybe it's not, you know, an insurance-backed allopathic professional, but identify somebody with whom you feel physically safe and approach them and ask them if they have the space to hear jumbled, mixed up feelings and ideas about what happened during your birth story. Ask them if they can hear that And if they can just listen and not say any platitudes, not try and explain anything, not try and justify anything, so that you can have this time to uninterruptedly tell your story, that already can change so much. There are a lot of things you can do in the name of self-care and taking care of yourself. But when it comes to traumatic events, often we need to look at how the autonomic nervous system functions. There's a really good YouTube video, actually, on uh, like it's, a, it's an eight minute explanation of the autonomic nervous system. I'm going to send you ladies that and then you can post that also like when you, when you post this, because that could be a, a great resource as well. But we need to look at how the autonomic nervous system functions. And part of that is about co-regulation, healing in relationships. And because birth trauma particularly can be one of the traumas, and I sometimes when I'm talking about trauma, talk about small T's and big T's. And for some people, birth trauma is a small T, and for some people, an enormous T. But birth trauma can particularly lead to feelings of shame. And that's also because we're, we're talking about a part of the body that anyway, rightly or wrongly, can carry a lot of shame for us. We're also talking about what it is to be often a mother presenting person in a very patriarchal society who talked about, oh, but your baby's healthy, everything's fine. That's what it's all about. So there can be so many perpetual compounding senses of shame that actually making that step to share your story in relationship is already such a huge, profound healing. So those are the things that I would say. That book, that YouTube video, reaching out to somebody in your network who is safe and who you can trust to hear you without trying to change anything about your story yeah I'm sure that's hard for a lot of us you know being international families and so we're here with our own immediate family and the most comfortable people usually are back home or living in a different country so that's yeah that might be all comes back to to building the village right yes. i mean this topic we we try to really try to compress this topic to two episodes but every interview we've had so for every episode the village comes up it's it's there <laughs> yeah. yeah it's it's enormous it's such a need yeah you know it's an ancestral biological imperative yeah but i do recognize what you're saying ava that that can be hard. Equally, what I would say is that sometimes choosing somebody safe to have a conversation with in a format like we're talking today, that it's kind of boundaried off and it's electronic connection and it's maybe not too much too soon, sometimes it can be helpful to have that online conversation because there's a very clear starting point and there's a very clear ending point as well. But I, I do hear what you're saying, and it is so true. We do need people around us. And honestly, what's also going on, sometimes my brain is like opening 70, 1700 tabs at a time. I've often thought about the idea of peer-to-peer birth trauma support, how that could be to, you know, once a, once a year, maybe twice a year, do a training to all mothers 
for parents in how to listen to each other, mm-hmm. not just for their trauma, but also for other topics. You know, what it is to offer somebody unconditional presence and that time where we are a witness to somebody. That would help. Yeah, I think in our society these days, we're so trained to solving things. So a lot of the times when you're talking, like you said, and then you you tell something and then the other person like, oh, but this can help and you can do this and have you tried this? And sometimes you just want to be like, shut up. I just want to, I just want to tell it. I don't need anything. I, what I need is I need to speak. I need to tell this. I don't need anything else. And this is so, so hard for the other person this listening and just also relieving myself from this pressure that I have to provide a solution. I have to fix this. No, I just need to be present. And and this is also then coming back to parenting. Sometimes I, I even get into this cycle sometimes with my child when she's upset. And then I try to, do you want this? Do you want this? Should we, should, should we fix this? But sometimes you just want to have a good cry and she just wants to have the space and then it's fine. And then it takes me five minutes. I don't need to pressure. I don't need to stress myself and then get into this whole rattle cage, but I just need to be there, hold the space. And then it's a storm and it's over. Something I did see a while ago, and it's something I have tried. I don't try it all the time, but I did see, I don't know where it was, but someone said, when you need to offload, send a text message to someone and just go, I need to talk. Are you like, do you have the capacity to listen or something like along those lines? And I remember using it with, I think, a friend or my sister or something. And I remember just kind of being like, this is giving them the time instead of picking up your phone, going, "Uh," you're giving them pre-warning for them to kind of go, I need to get into a space to be ready to kind of just listen to you vent, which is what I basically just do to my best friend like all day, every day about God knows what. But it is giving them that capacity, whereas normally you just pick up your phone and you rant, but you don't actually ask them, hey, because exactly what Myron said was people are just constantly problem solving. So you're kind of, they're just coming back at you and you're like, oh, and then it kind of like burns up and it's gone. And you're like, well, that wasn't what I hoped for. Yeah, you know, it does also come back to this point about, how we think we're meant to engage with motherhood, right? It is so hard when we are engaging with parenthood, with motherhood in a relatively aware and conscious way, that can very easily become positivity washed, eh? like glitter and fairy and butterfly washed versions. And that can also reduce our capacity for you know, how comfortable we are hearing negativity, hearing pain. And that's also why, you know, a structure like you describe is really good because even by making that request, you already drop into a higher level of presence and vulnerability and openness. And you're naming that that's what you need. And that is, that is a skill that we do owe it to ourselves to cultivate more of being comfortable hearing difficult things hearing pain and also asserting our boundaries about when and how and where we can drop into offering that space because goodness knows we don't get that with our children right it's just (laughs) here we are again in the middle of the tsunami (laughs) but with each other we can practice safety. Yeah. Yeah. I guess we're going to round up here, but I have one last question. So coming back to basically, if you're in the first trimester and if you've gone through a bereavement or a loss previously, or if you've had a traumatic birth, what can we do in the first trimester? Because obviously there's going to be more anxiety building. Is there something you can share with this, something you can, you know, suggest just to help people give people a bit more a skill or a tool maybe that will help them kind of be able to deal with them, that awful feeling that arises? Yeah, very good question. I think the first thing I would say is regardless of who your care provider is, your medical care provider, really try to create an opening in one of the very first appointments to name that you are feeling the effects of something traumatic or that you're experiencing higher levels of anxiety because of something difficult that's happened and that you would like them to know that so that they can offer you trauma-informed care. 
it is possible that a care provider may say, what do you mean exactly with trauma-informed care? And I, from the course that I teach, I do have a manifesto that I often give to clients to attach to their birth plans when they make a very specific request in their birth preferences and birth planning documents, they make the request in black and white to receive trauma-informed care, and then they attach the manifesto afterwards because it's a one-pager stipulating exactly what they mean by that. And one of the premises of that is that they don't have to disclose exactly what it is that was traumatic or that has given them this anxiety. The other thing I would say is, again, reach out for some support. It is not too late to address those topics in your pregnancy. Your baby somehow has existed in your womb your whole life, in your mother's womb their whole life, and also in the womb of your mother's mother. So it's highly unlikely that this growing baby is going to encounter anything that somehow energetically they've not encountered before. Take that weight off your shoulders. It's okay to feel sometimes some difficult feeling. And also, you know, I know it can be a very difficult topic because I know it's a little bit kind of riddled in privilege. Really consider the possibility of working with a trauma-informed doula in your pregnancy, for your birth, and for those weeks and months afterwards. Because the companionship and the unconditional presence that a doula offers is a game changer. No matter how pregnancy unfolds or how birth unfolds, that presence, that relationship is, or should be, if it's a good one, an unconditional holy witness to you. I can testify to this because I've had a doula and I've my birth changed very dramatically from what I had envisioned and she was my rock and I felt safe because she she was like you said she was a witness to everything and so yes I can only I can only say yes to everything you just said regarding the doula yes yeah there are student doulas I I can't speak for every doula but you know I can speak for myself when I say you know I would literally be happy for somebody to pay me something on a monthly basis for a year or two so that they could afford to have me by their sides. I am pretty boundaried about my fees and I think we should also normalize doulas being boundaried about their fees because you know so much to be on call 24 7 but there's always always a possibility always a possibility and you know i am a doula i've been a doula for 10 years i would never give birth without a doula never and i do think that the money that you spend on a doula is going to pay dividends and offer a lot more value than money that you might spend on the latest bugaboo yeah yeah agreed (laughs) sorry no no sorry bugaboo could also you know could also be jewels i don't know we're not associated uh, no, or affiliated also, with any brands. <laughs> but this is also a, a nice thing when, when especially with a second child, when you already have everything and then the relatives ask, oh, what can we give? What can we give? And then say, I want a doula. So anyone, don't spend, I don't need another romper. I don't need another rattle. I don't need another thing. I need support. And this is a good thing. Then everyone can chip in. And this is what I really want, especially with the second one where it's like, oh, what can we give you? This, you can give me, me support so I can birth in the way I want to. That's, I mean, that's exactly the reason I actually to bring it up but that's exactly the reason i set up gift guild was because i wanted to provide support as a gift because the greatest gift you get is two hands yeah. it's not the romper it's not the whatever and that was the biggest thing because anyone giving birth in pandemic no matter where you live i'm sure we all suffer the same but being international families living away from our homes that was my thing and that was like the first people i were going to were like would you be into this you know because this could be a group gifting you know because at the end of the day as exactly as you say there's got to be boundaries because at the end of the day it's a lot of hours it's a lot of emotion there's a lot of there's a lot of everything involved in this it's not just oh you know just get the cheapest one to go it's like well actually it's about who you click with um and so it's just yeah and so it's so that was that was actually the whole premise of the registry was just literally to say you know treat yourself you know baby as long as mama's good as long as papa's there you know i mean as long as everyone's there and present baby's gonna be just fine baby's gonna thrive yeah exactly yeah Yeah, exactly 
The one last thing I would say about doula worth, sometimes people can have, you know, question marks about somebody actually being there on the day. I could talk for hours about how that's not a thing, but if that is really a thing and it's a blockage, don't overlook the fact that a lot of doulas also do work where they're not on call, where they're not going to attend your birth. You know, one of the things that I do a lot is a four session kind of package of care. We have three sessions in pregnancy where we're looking at what happened, where we're looking ahead at how things want to be and where we can bring those two visions together and look at some very specific tools and ideas about how that can work. And then we have that debrief that you've given birth and you get to be witnessed and how as you process how the new experience was. And that also makes a massive difference. Yeah. We, we actually will be having or we've had we've been spoken to doula trainers and so yeah because we, we wanted to kind of go into how are they trained and like yeah. so I mean like people will be able to listen into that episode as well because it's really important for people to understand the process what they've gone through you know who they are so yeah and we our aspirations are to actually interview all different doulas so we can hear their voices and we can kind of get a an idea of yeah. who they are and everything else as well so just to Very start good. giving voices to the community out there beautiful yeah, very good. Yeah, I guess with that, we're going to wrap up. It's been a lot longer than we anticipated, but that was the idea was to hold space and actually take however much time we actually needed to, because it is a very important topic that we don't want anyone to ignore. And hopefully this might even, as you say, like even one person listening might kind of go, actually, maybe I need to revisit whatever that might be. We'll see how it goes. I mean, everyone can contact us. We'll pass on your details. You know, they'll be able to find all your information um, in the show notes. Thank you so much for your time, Elena. And for those listening, we've actually, upon our first chat with Elena last week, I think it was, we actually have decided to actually run a series with Elena to talk about different kind of elements of trauma and birthing and in through different phases of pregnancy and postpartum. And I'm sure there's going to be a lot more episodes to come and we'll be hearing the wonderful voice of Elena. And hopefully we'll be able to do it in one room as well because yes. currently we're in very different places yes. <laughs> in different yes. countries yeah <laughs> definitely um, yeah so thank you so much elena i um, greatly appreciate it and we'll be yeah back with you soon enough i'm sure Lovely. so thank you again for your time and for your you. wise words and honestly i did not expect to have a tear in my eye and needing a tissue but i can't reach a tissue from your little story <laughs> earlier it was yeah always a good cry with elena i could say <laughs> We'll call it the crying sessions. Yeah. <laughs> I think so. I have never, I literally, I have never talked to you without crying. And I mean this in the most positive way. Even when I met you in person and you shared a story and I said, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm tearing up. So every time I talk to you and I mean this in the most appreciative way, I'm crying. <laughs> I'm very happy to yeah to impact that release you know there's a there's a shamanic perspective huh, on crying and the shamanic perspective on crying is that with each tear that falls we reclaim a part of our lost soul oh i've got loads of souls in my back pocket if that's loads of souls loads of parts i'm all about it no. okay well thank you so much and um it's nice to actually end on a bit of a laugh because it's we you know we've been apprehensive but we really wanted to discuss this but it's it's great to be able to smile see each other smiling here yes. at the moment so exactly exactly and that's that's really maybe that's the last soundbite like trauma isn't a pathology quite the opposite quite the opposite so <laughs> I know this was a, a very heavy topic. However, as you heard, we did end on a light note. And it's always such an honor to have a conversation with Elena. We cried, we laughed. And this is what happens when you speak with her because she just really brings out all the emotions. And I thought it was very special to talk with her. What do you think, Eva? Absolutely. You know, anytime I've spoken to her, you have this thing of, oh, I can just tell her anything. Uh, yes. She's she she actually is like this open space. She is that person that everyone needs in their life. Yeah, I just I, you know, honestly, I'll never see sunflowers in the same light. <laughs> So, but yeah, I mean, I'm not going to lie. I was actually telling the ladies earlier, like I literally couldn't get my tissue out of my box because it was a full box and I didn't want to make noise. But yeah, it's, you know, everyone's everyone's emotions are valid and everyone Welcome. has 
Yeah, yeah. And welcome. Yeah. And they, you know, everyone, we all have space, you know, and everyone should be open to give that space because we all hurt somehow in one way or another. And childbirth is a very unique experience for every single person. Even if you have 10 kids, every single birth will be different, I'm sure. Yeah. We hope this showed you that there is the space the space is there for you there are people there and there's yeah. people being trained and elena as she said herself she's actually training people and hopefully you know you will be able to find your person be it your peer your family your friend or your doula that you'll be able to entrust and maybe you know have an open conversation yeah and now i will go off and bulk order a bunch of tissues because we have elena back for more episodes and <laughs> yeah. I need to prepare myself. <laughs> yeah, I'm already thinking like, oh, wow, we're going to have to start buying shares or something in the tissue company. We're really looking forward to this new series that we'll be running with Lena. We're, we're actually in the works of trying to figure out how to provide it because it's such an important and it's in the shadows. You know, and we want to bring this to light and we want everyone to know, like ev all your feelings are valid and we want people to know there are people out there ready and willing to help you. Exactly. We hope this episode was helpful for everyone listening and we will be back with more from us and Elena. And until then, we're here in the next episode. Take care.